Nestled high in the mountains of the Uber Salzburg, the Berghof was not just Adolf Hitler's vacation home, but one of the most important centers of government in the Third Reich. From this chalet-style retreat in southern Bavaria, Hitler made decisions with devastating consequences for all of Europe. It was here the annexation of Austria was plotted, and a plan for the invasion of Poland was formulated. Apart from the Wolf's Lair, Hitler's headquarters on the Eastern Front, it was the Berghof where Hitler spent more time than any other place while serving as Führer of the Third Reich. It was 1922 when Adolf Hitler's fascination with the hills above Berchtesgarten first began. Under the alias of Mr. Wolf, he would visit his friend and mentor, Dietrich Eckhart, who resided at the Pension Moritz, later known as the Platterhof Hotel. In these picturesque mountains bordering his native Austria, a young Hitler would soon hold meetings with party supporters in local guesthouses. In 1925, after his release from Landsberg prison following the Munich Beer Hall Putsch, Hitler would retreat to a small wooden dependence of the Pension Moritz and settle down to complete work on his political manifesto, Mein Kampf. After his ascension to Führer, this small wooden dependence would become known as the Kampfhausel, a makeshift shrine to the leader of the Third Reich. Hitler would continue to visit until 1926, when the family owners of the Pension Moritz sold the hotel. He found little to like about the new management and briefly moved his mountain quarters to the Marienheim before settling into the Deutsches Haus in Berchtesgarten. Here he would dictate the second volume of Mein Kampf, later known as Hitler's second book, in 1926. The Berghof itself began life as a much smaller residence known as Haus Wackenfeld, a pretty, alpine-style holiday home situated close to the Pension Moritz and next door to the Hotel Sumterken. Built in 1916 by businessman Otto Winter, the residence was rented to Hitler for 100 marks a month by Winter's widow in 1928. After becoming Chancellor of Germany in 1933, Hitler purchased the house for 40,000 marks, the money coming from the royalties he received from the publishing of his best-selling book, Mein Kampf. By 1936, Hitler had accumulated enough wealth to renovate House Wackenfeld. Though in Albert Speer's book, The Spandau Diaries, Speer, Hitler's architect, minister of armaments and perhaps the closest thing he had to a friend, claimed that money had run out for the rebuilding of the Berghof, and that Hitler obtained an advance of several hundred thousand marks from his publisher on an existing manuscript, that for reasons of foreign policy, he did not wish to have published just yet. This book would not be published in Hitler's lifetime and was only discovered in 1960. Once funding was secured, the small chalet-style building was expanded by architect Alois de Garno, under the supervision of Martin Bormann. The original wooden villa was preserved and incorporated into a much larger concrete building. A large terrace featuring colorful, resort-style umbrellas was erected, as was a grand hall furnished with period Teutonic furniture. An expansive dining room was panelled with expensive sembra pine, and a large library was built, furnished with books on history, painting, architecture and music. Perhaps most impressive of all, was a sprawling picture window that once lowered into the wall, revealed sweeping open-air views of the snow-capped mountains of Austria. Haus Wackenfeld was now rechristened, the Berghof. The Mountain Court. In 1938, after yet more renovations, British magazine Better Homes and Gardens described the chalet as bright and airy, with a light jade green color scheme. Caged hearts roller canaries were kept in most of the rooms, which were furnished with antiques, mostly German furniture from the 18th century. Old engravings hung in the guest bedrooms, along with some of Hitler's small watercolor sketches. Hitler himself was described as his own decorator, designer, furnisher and architect. According to the memoirs of Hitler's personal valet, Heinz Lingher, Hitler and his longtime companion Eva Braun had two bedrooms and two bathrooms with interconnecting doors, and they would end most evenings together in his study. Guests at the Berghof residence included political figures, monarchs, heads of state, and diplomats as well as singers, painters, and musicians. Important visitors were personally greeted on the steps by Hitler himself. The social circle at Hitler's retreat included his lover, Eva Braun, and her sister Gretel. 
Eva's friend, Marion Schoenmann, Heinrich Hoffmann, and the partners and children of high-ranking Nazi party members such as those of Martin Bormann, Heinrich Himmler, and Joseph Goebbels. A group photo was taken every year with Nazi leaders and Hitler's staff on the occasion of Hitler's birthday. Albert Speer described the typical social scene at the Berghof in his book, Spandau, The Secret Diaries. The atmosphere was more like the summer residence of a prosperous industrialist than the mountain castle of the inaccessible Führer. On the terrace we would stand around informally while the ladies stretched out on wicker reclining chairs. They sunned themselves as if they were at a spa, for being tanned was the fashion. Select SS men from Zepp Dietrich's bodyguard regiment, with perfect manners that seemed a shade too intimate, handed around drinks such as champagne, vermouth, and soda and fruit juice. Hitler's valet would eventually appear, telling us that the Führer would arrive in ten minutes, as he had retired to the upper floor for a few moments rest after a long meeting. At the news of Hitler's imminent arrival, the buzz of conversation becomes somewhat muted, the bursts of laughter cease. The women drop into murmurs as they continue chatting about clothes and traveling. Eva Braun takes her movie camera from the reclining chair, with her is Negus, a black Scottish terrier named after the Emperor of Abyssinia. She prepares to film the entrance. Hitler appears in civilian dress, in a well-tailored suit that is somewhat too loud. His tie is not well chosen. In spite of the good weather, he is wearing a velour hat with a wide brim, somewhat wider than the fashion, because he tends to sunburn. He greets each of the guests with friendly words, asks about everyone's children, personal plans, and circumstances. From the moment of his entrance the scene has changed. Everyone is tense, visibly trying to make a good impression. Yet Hitler wants an air of unforced sociability that will not seem servile but will instead put people at their ease, and cover over the fact that once back in Berlin, these same people will revert to their usual fawning manner. Here Hitler tries to be genial and by his behavior encourages us to act relaxed. Half an hour passes, before we are asked to the table. Hitler leads the way alone, Martin Bormann following with Eva Braun. We pass by the cloakroom. In high spirits, one of the young adjutants tries on Hitler's hat, which a servant has put aside, the hat falls over both his ears. Although Hitler's interest in us was more a matter of form than genuine concern, he was still less constrained on these occasions than at any other time and scarcely ever tried to pose. According to Speer, on certain days the SS would open the gates of the Uber Salzburg property. A column five yards wide, consisting of thousands upon thousands of admirers, filed past Hitler, who stood in a raised place, visible to all. People waved, women shed tears of exultation. Hitler would point out a child to his chauffeur, Kempke, and an SS man would lift the child above the crowd. Then the inevitable group picture would be taken. Hitler seemed eager for such pictures. The children themselves often looked rather unhappy. In the same book, from a diary entry of April 5, 1951, Speer likens the annual cost of maintaining the Berghof to that of maintaining the Spandau prison. 400,000 marks a year, an expensive price tag even for the Führer. Hitler's time at his beloved Berghof would draw to an end on July 14, 1944, when he would leave for the final time to head to his military headquarters in East Prussia. Never to return. <laughs>